Hello, this is Guillermo Campitelli, and this video is about the general linear model. There are many versions of the general linear model. In this video, I'm going to refer to three of these versions. And when I mean version, I don't mean the content of the model. So you can have models with one parameter, with two parameters, three, four, five, six, whatever. And, and these are different versions, but I'm not talking about that. I'm, I'm talking about more general forms of the general linear model. So version one is the deterministic version. And in that uh, version, we've got a variable y, which we call the outcome variable, and a variable x, which we call the predictor variable. These names, outcome and predictor variables, are the typic typically used in the context of the general linear model. In other contexts, uh, the, the y can also be called the dependent variable, and x could be uh, called the independent variable. So we've got these two variables, uh, which we are going to measure. We are going to uh, we have a measurement in an archive, or or we conduct a study in which we uh, survey. We collect data in these two variables, or we conduct an experiment, and we've got data on those two in these variables, or some of the variables we the um, independent variables, sometimes we can choose the, the values of that, those variables. Okay, so this is the, 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 the variables in the model, and then we've got two parameters uh, in this case. We can have a model with one parameter that we are going to see later in the video. And these parameters, typically you are the beta, the Greek letter beta is used, and we use the beta zero for the first one, beta one, for the second one, and then we keep adding uh, parameters, could be beta 2, beta 3, beta 4, etc. Okay, so the beta 0 is what we call the intercept, and because this is um, the value of y in predicted by the model, that corresponds to x0. And so that's where um, the prediction of the model intercepts the y-axis. So, what's beta 1? Beta 1 is called the slope of the model, and it's the uh, increase in, in the prediction for a value of y based off an increase of one unit of x. Let, let's give you an example. Let's say beta, beta 0 is 5 and beta 1 is 2, and, and we start with the, the x value is 0. So for x equals 0, then the prediction for y is 5. Okay, because if we do uh, 5 times 0 is 0, and beta, one, beta 0 is 5, so that's our prediction of y. So if x equals 0, our prediction of y is 5. That is what we call the intercept. Now, what happens if we change, we increase one unit of x? What would be our prediction of y? Well, our prediction of y will increase two units, but that, because that's that's um, beta one. Beta one is two. So, if we follow the formula, that's five plus two times one. Two times one is two. So, the prediction of y is seven. So we predicted 5 if x equals 0, we predicted 7 if x equals 1, and then if x equals 2, then it will be 9, because we are adding two more points. If x equals 3, then it will be 11, because we add two more points. So that's beta 1. Beta 1 is how many uh, points uh, of increase in the, in the values of y the model predicts as a function of an increase in one unit of x. Okay, that's version one. Version two is uh, contains the same component of version one that we call it the deterministic component of the model, and it has a stochastic or probabilistic version. So we've got again y equals beta zero plus beta one times x, but we add a component which is the st stochastic part, which is plus epsilon. And when we add that epsilon is distributed, so that tilde uh, symbol means that uh, it's distributed, 
normally, so that's a normal distribution. We spend a lot of time with normal distributions, so you know what it is. And the mean of that distribution is zero, and the standard deviation of that distribution is sigma. Now, in both in the deterministic version and in this deterministic and stochastic version, the values of beta 0 and beta 1 will be determined after we observe the data. And we are going to go to that a bit in a bit. Um, again, sigma in this model would also be determined by the data. Now, what does it mean? What does it mean, this, this stochastic version? Well, it means that the prediction is not going to be perfect. So the model, um, the deterministic part of the model makes a prediction for each, for each value of x, what is the value of y we expect, but it acknowledges this version of the model that that prediction won't be perfect and some, some of the data will be close to the values predicted, but some will be not so close and basically we we say that they are going to be distributed. Um, some would be a bit more than what the predicted value, some would be a bit less, but we expect that would be close, um, and it's very unlikely that will be very far from that prediction. That's a normal distribution. Okay, so that, that's version two. Version three is very similar to version two, but it brings the stochastic component to the forefront of the model. So it says y is distributed normally. So we do, so we, we start with the, the the stochastic or probabilistic component of the model first, and is distributed normally with a mean of y. Eh, sorry, a mean of gamma. Just that's the, the Greek letter gamma, and the standard deviation is the small sigma. And now we add to that this the this deterministic part comes second. We say gamma equals beta 1 plus beta, sorry, beta 0 plus beta 1 times x. And so mathematically, version 2 and version 3 are exactly the same. Um, the advantages of version 3 is that you can make the, uh, the, the linear model, the general linear model, very complex with a lot of parameters. But the first part of the model, normal, uh, with mean of gamma and standard deviation of sigma, that won't change because we have just that gamma. We just then define gamma in, diff in a different way. Um, okay, so I'm going to, uh, in most of this video, I'm going to use the version 1. Um, uh, but uh, I want you to know that these versions exist and in other other videos um, at, um, at the end of this video I'm going to uh, talk about these versions again. Okay, so one important part of this course is to link causality with statistics and we said that there are two different things so if we use statistics only we cannot establish causality and so we use causal models to establish causality and we link the causal model to a statistical model. So let's start with the causal model. And this causal model, we've got the causal variable u and the uh, effect y or the consequence variable y. And u, remember that we use for an unknown variable or a set of unknown variables. So basically we are saying the, the values of y are affected by some variables that we don't know. Basically, I, I, we are not saying much. We, don't, we are actually not establishing causality because we don't know what variables affect why. Okay. Um, in terms of the linear model, of the general linear model, we can, we can express that with y equals beta zero. So basically, we eliminated the component in which the x variable is, um, uh, is part of the model. We eliminated that and we are saying, well, there is no, we, we can predict the value of y somehow, uh, but not based on a ver another variable. And here we've got a three versions of the model. So beta one plus epsilon, and the, then we say that 
epsilon is normally distributed. So I, sometimes we use n for normal. We don't write the whole thing. Or we just say that y is normally distributed with gamma and sigma, uh, and then gamma equals beta zero. Okay, so this is the linear model. And uh, one thing in, in, in statistics uh, is we've got the, the mathematical formulation, but sometimes it's useful to have a graphical representation. It is informative. You're going to see that in some, com in some models, the visual representation is not so good. Uh, so, but we are going to use visual representations when they give us some insight uh, and they allow us to understand uh, the models. Okay, so I want you to start. I want you. I want us to start very, very simple. Let's say we've got one variable y that is measured from value zero to one hundred, and we need to generate a model in which we have to predict the values of one data point that we haven't observed yet, and. We are told that we need to give some one value, so we can only use one value. Okay, so I, I don't have any idea except that, but my experience in research tells me that typically we observe values that are not in the extremes. And because of that experience, I choose the number 50. Okay, so that's my prediction, that's my model. And then we observe the data, so we observe one data point. Okay, the data is 80. It wasn't too bad, so the, the prediction was 50, the data was 80. Still 30 points of difference, so not so good a model of the data. Uh, but it's better than if I chose zero as, as, my, as, a, as my model, my predictive model, and the data comes as 80. So this is not so bad. Um, we can we can do a different approach. Let's observe the data first, and then I make the prediction. Oh, OK, so if I do that, my prediction would be perfect. Because I observed the data, then I predict that it would be the one I observed. But of course, you may think that this is cheating, and, and it is. But I tell you that, in a sense, we have to do that. We are not going to do it in this way, because this is cheating. But doing this captures one component, that one thing of this process that I, I want you to, uh, to consider, which is, first, we observe some data, and we try to explain what we observed. And we explain that we, we give a formality, a mathematical formula. So that, in, in, in a sense, is, is a good thing. Um, and the other thing is that sometimes we have to use the data to uh, to for doing the prediction. You are going to see that a bit later. Now, so in a sense, it's cheating, but it's not cheating because of uh, of the process we do. Um, it's just that it's a, use, a useless way of making predictions. Because the reason we use models is, well, we try to explain the data we observed, but we would like to use that same model to predict future data. So let's, let's see one ex an example. We're going to use this model that we use to predict this data point to predict the values of new 99 new data points that we haven't observed yet. So our prediction would be 80. I'm going to use my model y equals 50 as well to see how they do, how they both predict. So we've got here the 100 observations. And we've got the uh, the y equals 80 model that we use after observing the first data point, and it was a perfect prediction, but see how, how bad that prediction is now. Now, I want you to consider uh, that the, the, I did some jittering of these uh, data points, so these, the blue dots, the light blue dots, are the data points, and 
it only matters the y-axis. So the, uh, the horizontal separation of the dots, I did uh, jittering so we can see the dots. If we, can, if we put all the dots in one line, that, that would be the way of doing it. Uh, there would be a lot of overlap and we cannot see all the dots. So this way we do jittering, we can see all the dots, but consider that there is no, the horizontal separation is nothing informative, it's just aesthetic. So um, um, we've got the model on top, the square model is the y equals 18 model, uh, that's the, the, the brown model on top, and the red one, y equals 50, that's my model. So see how bad, if we see the, the vertical separation between the data points and the models, the y equals 80, all the, all the data points, except the one we observed at the beginning, are between 0 and 75. So very, very far. My model, y equals 50, which had the information that, well, typically the values are not in the extremes, uh, is much better, is much closer than the, to the dots than the other model. But still not very good. So we are going to see that there is a way to, to generate a model uh, that uh, it uh, also uses only one value to predict these 100 observations, uh, and it's not as bad as the y equals 80 or the y equals 50. So we can do better than that. Okay, so we add a third model here. We've got the y equals 80, the y equals 50, and the third model, which is a linear model, y equals beta 0. And that beta 0 is what tells us this, par this parameter is two things. One is that typically we are interested in something that is not in this data set, but it is in a population. And remember, population in statistics is not people, it's just a large set of values. So, so basically that beta zero is a parameter in the population. Um, and the other thing, because we're using a Greek letter and not a number, means that we don't know that number. So we are going to use the data to estimate that number. Okay, so basically the, uh, the orange square, which is between 30 and 40, that orange square is the value that we are going to use to replace beta zero. What, what is that value? Well, the, that value is the mean of the sample. So if you obtain the mean of the 100, and 100 observations, that is our best prediction for, uh, for the data. So if we can only use one value to predict the data, it would be the mean of the data. But see what happened here. We had the, before observing the data, we had a model that was y equals beta zero. And after observing the data, we now we, we say y equals the mean, which is around 37. Um, now, remember what we did at, at the beginning. We observed the data and then we made, made the prediction. And we are doing here a bit of the same. After observing the data, we are making the prediction. It's not cheating because we are not doing something we could do, which is to, to choose a square for each of the 100 observations. That would be cheating. But again, why is, why is cheating? It's, it's actually not cheating. It's just useless because we want to use the model to predict future data. And we already know that if we use this uh, thing of matching what we observe and using that as the model for predicting future data is a very bad, uh, a very bad way of of uh, choosing a model. So we have some structure before observing the data y equals beta zero, and when we observe the data, we change to y equals say 37, and we are going to use this y equals 37 to make predictions for future data. 
and that is the best model we can have. So this is the simplest of the models. It's a linear model with, with only one parameter, and we also call it the mean model because the best, the best number that of, uh, to replace beta zero is the mean of the sample. Okay, things will become now more complicated, but before that, we talked about lines. The linear model, the linear comes from line, and it is a linear model because we can draw a line that, uh, that represents the model. So here are the lines of the three models we have, and we can see that the um, orange line is the one that is uh, less, um, is closer uh, to the dots. Okay. Now the other characteristic of this is that we can choose different lines, um, horizontal lines that they have the same value, but none of the lines will be better than the mean. This is the, the line that reduces the, the, the difference between the data and the prediction the most. But we can do better if we have more information. So let's now let's move to a causal model in which we have one predictor uh, variable um, x, and, and we've got uh, one that is not known, u. So basically, in a sense, it's just uh, one predictor variable. So we've got the linear model becomes now as at the beginning, y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 times x. And we've got the, the version that is the, the one that adds the stochastic or probabilistic component, and the one that puts the probabilistic component at the uh, at the first place. Okay, so let's see what sort of um, uh, situation we have. So in this case we've got again 100 observations and we've got um, variable y but we also have variable x and as you know each dot here represents one participant um, that contributed with a, a measurement in X and in measurement in Y. So the dots uh, represent uh, observations on both variables, on X and Y. Okay, so now uh, in this, uh, with this type of data in which and we have to say that both X and Y are numeric variables um, and we've got here the two models the simple model, which is the mean model, so model 1, beta 0, so that's the orange line, and, and basically if we can use only one value, one parameter, that would be the best model, but we can do better than that if we add the information provided by the x variable. So we can do beta 0 times beta 1 times x, sorry, beta 0 plus beta 1 times x. And that is the green oblique line. And obviously, the green oblique line is a better model here because it's closer to the dots. Okay, so this is, this is a um, simple. Now, what happened when the, the x uh, variable is a a nominal variable. So x has value 0 and 1, but 0 and 1 are used as a code. So basically this could be um, a group that it, uh, goes through one condition and another group and it's called 0. Another group goes through another condition and it's called 1. So these, these are the, the values of the nominal variable. Uh, or it could be a group that went through a control and another one went through treatment zero is control, one is treatment. So we, the only thing that these numbers mean is the zero is absence of one and one is presence of one. That's the only thing we can say numerically, but apart from that, they are categories, they are not numbers. Now, the model is exactly the same. 
as the, the linear model for numeric predictor variables. Uh, and here we've got the same situation, we've got two models, and there are two lines, one is the, the, the light blue, like we have, which has the color of the, of the dots, uh, but you can almost not see that, uh, and the other one is the dark blue, the dark blue is the mean model. So, here we've got uh, the case in which the linear, the model that incorporates the predictor variable x is quite bad because it's not better than the mean model. And it is bad because basically there is no relationship between x and y. That, that's why it's a bad model. It's not because we, did, we didn't try hard. It's because there is no relationship. So if there is no relationship, then we have to think, well, is it worse to add one parameter to the to the to the model, or we just keep the beta zero? That's one one thing that will become uh, important later, which is that the models with least number of parameters are better. So we we are sorry, not better. They are preferable. So we have to reduce the number of parameters in the models. Um, so if we add a new parameter to a model, then that model has to predict much better the data than the previous model. This is the case in which this is not the case. Um, the beta 1 times x doesn't provide a better prediction, and that's because there is no connection between x and y. Now, we move to a model with two predictor variables uh, and one unknown variable, or a set of an unknown variables. So we've got the, the connection between x and y and the connection between z and y. So basically, the model becomes y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 times x plus beta 2 times z. And, it, and, and the, the other versions are equivalent. So one important thing here is that um, the beta 2 uh, and the beta 1 uh, parameters are very similar to what, they, what beta 1 was in the model with one predictor variable, but there is a little bit of a difference. So basically, uh, as before, beta 1 is the change in the prediction of the y value based on an increase of one unit in x but we have to add a little bit more. When the values of z are kept constant, what does it mean? Well, it means that if um, we've got, we, we only do the relationship between x and y, we, we, get, we calculate the relationship between x and y when the value of z is, let's say, zero. We calculate the relationship between x and y when the values of z are 10, and so on and so forth. And basically, the beta 1 will be a, an average of those calculations. And the same for beta 2. Beta 2 is the increase in z, sorry, the increase in y that is predicted by, as a function of an increase of one unit of z, when the values of x are kept constant. So this is the difference we, when we add uh, two predictor variables. And when we add more, there is no difference. So that's, um, it, it's the same. So that's all, all, all we need to know in terms of what the parameters uh, mean in, uh, in linear models. Okay, so I'm going to move directly to a, a visual representation of a case in which we've got two predictor variables, x and z, and one a outcome variable, y, and the, uh, the two predictor variables are nominal. So we've got x can be 0 and 1, and z can be 0 and 1. Now, the... The, visual rep the, the model is the same as if the, the x and z were numerical, the, the model 
mathematical model will be the same. Um, but the visual representation of, of two numerical predictor variables is, it can be done, it, it would be to have a, to draw, to draw in a two uh, dimensions, to draw a three dimension cube and put the dots in that three dimension cube. It can be done, but I believe that this is not very informative. And the line, it becomes a plane in that cube. Um, so I prefer not to do that, to present that visual representation. The visual representation gives us insight. When it becomes less informative, then we don't use that. Now, um, and then, because we can add more parameters, more variables, and, and then it will become impossible to represent those. So we, we, we gather insight by when the visual representations are useful, and then we continue with the mathematical formulation. Okay, so one of the things that I have to add, which is important, is that the model is the same here because these two nominal variables have two values only. And it only works when the two nominal variables have two values only. If they have three values, it, this model doesn't work. We are going to see that later. Okay, so basically uh, here we've got represented a, a number of things. So the blue, the dark blue line is the mean model. So it's the same prediction when the values of uh, the same predictions uh, for all the possible combinations of x and z. So if x is zero and z is zero, that's on the on the top left, the, the red dots in the top left. Uh, uh, so that the prediction is 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 a, a value. Now if x equals zero and z equals one, so the green the green dots on the bottom, uh, and when x equals zero, the prediction is still the same. If, if x equal, equals one and z equals zero, so the red dots on the right, the prediction of the mean model is the same. And if x equal, equals one and z equals one, so the green dots on, on the bottom of, of the right column, the prediction is the same. So. As always, the, model, the mean model, or, or, or um, the model with just beta zero, makes the same prediction for all the data points. Model two, it incorporates uh, beta zero times beta one times x, sorry, beta zero plus beta one times x, plus beta two times z. And that is represented by the black lines. So the black lines, the top black oblique line and the bottom line, these are the predictions. So this model make, uses uh, four values to predict. It will predict one value for x0 and z0, one value for x0, z1, a different value for x1, z0, and another different value for x1, z1. Now, um, that model is not a, can be improved. It can be improved because um, if you see the, the red line and the green line, this would be the, the better, the, the, the best model possible. And so the, the, the models with the black lines are not as good. Now, what typically is done in uh, statistics is to add a component which is to the linear model which is the interaction between x and z and that would align the black line to the red and green lines now that statistically is the right thing to do but because we are, talk, uh, are um, using causality as well as statistics if there is the case that we need to use uh, an interaction. What it means is that the causal relationship between x and y changes at different values of z. 
So to me, what it means is that we need to do to use two causal models for the relationship between x and y. One would be for the values of z equals 0, and another for the values z equals 1. If we do that, we reproduce the, the green and the red line models. OK, so now we've got a case in which uh, this model mathematically is the same as the previous one, but it comes from a very different situation. So it comes from a situation in which we've got one predictor variable only, x, and one outcome variable, y. Now, but the, the, the variable x is a nominal variable, and it has three possible values, 0, 1, and 2. Now, this could be, um, an example of this would be that whether nationality uh, affects uh, the number of hours of study, um, and let's say that x equals 0 means Australia, x equals 1 means New Zealand, and x equals, one, x equals 2 is China, so that's nationality. Does nationality, af nationality affect the number of uh, hours of study? Um, well, so basically, these 0, 1, and 2, it doesn't make sense to say uh, New Zealand is one more unit than Australia or China is two more units than Australia. These numbers are just used for coding. Uh, so we cannot use those numbers and, and draw a line that goes from 0 to, to 2. So, um, what we need to do is what we uh, call create two dummy variables. So instead of using x, variable x, we are going to create one dummy variable called x1 and one dummy variable called x2. And what those variables be now become, it become something like um, one would be being New Zealander. And X2 would be being Chinese. Now, what about Australia? Being Australian. We don't need that variable. So because we are going to use Australia as the reference class. So basically, X1 would be being New Zealander, and it would be relative to being Australian. So it would be compared to being Australian. And, and, and X2 would be being a Chinese relative to being Australian. So we are going to compare to being Australian. So because Australian is the reference class, we don't need to create a dummy variable for uh, Australia. Now, if we had four values, we need to create three dummy variables. If we have five values, we need to create four dummy variables. So always one less than the number of, of values in the nominal variable. So basically now uh, the, the, blue, the, uh, this, the blue line is the mean model again and makes the same prediction for the three nationalities. And then the black lines represent the linear models with dummy variables. So basically uh, the, the line that goes from 0 to 1 means that we need uh, to start with uh, the mean uh, of uh, the mean hours in Australians. Um, to when we go to New Zealanders, there is a reduction of number of hours in the prediction, and that is is uh, denoted by the beta one parameter. And then uh, when uh, the the line that goes from zero to two is the increase in hours from being Australian to being Chinese. And that's denoted by the parameter beta 2. So now the x1 and x2, they can only take two values, 0 and 1. So x1 would be is 0 if you are not New Zealander, and 1 if you are New Zealander. x2 is 0 if you are not Chinese, and 1 if you are Chinese. So basically, these two variables that it becomes like 
two different nominal variables and the analysis becomes the same as in the previous case. Okay, so in this last slide, what I want to show is the three versions of the models and a better visual representation of them. So again, the blue, the dark blue line is the mean model and the, the solid black line represents the deterministic part of the linear model and the dotted line represents the probabilistic part. So basically what we are saying is that our best prediction is given by the deterministic part and the probabilistic part says, well, but that pre that's the best prediction, but we expect that will be a variability uh, from that line. And that variability follows the distribution that we choose. Typically we use a normal distribution. So, the, the range there is, is, is narrow, and that's very good. So the model tried to make as best predictions, as, I'm sorry, as precise predictions as possible. So if that, if that range is narrow, then that's a good thing. Now, but being narrow, some of the dots were, are outside the range. So, so if we want to capture those, they need to be within that range. So, if, the, if we choose a higher value for sigma, then it will increase the range. Remember, sigma is a standard deviation. That's the, the standard deviation of a normal distribution. So, the range will be larger. Um, so, there is a balance we need to, to do between being as precise as possible, and that would be a small uh, sigma, but we want to capture as many as many data points as possible, and that would be a large sigma. So, in future uh, chapters, we are going to see how we deal with these two competing interests in the in the modeling: precision and capturing predicting the data.